and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Hi, everyone. I'm Lori LeBay, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I am thrilled you're able to join us today. We are going to have a wonderful conversation about changing perceptions and stigma through art and learning how purpose and so many things can change when we allow someone to be creative. Now, for those of you that are new to Alzheimer Speaks Radio, we are about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to have real conversations with real people. And so that's exactly what we're going to do today. We are going to be talking with Dr. Daniel C. Potts, who is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. And he is a neurologist, an author, an educator, and a really a true champion of those living with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementias, as well as care partners. He was inspired by his father's transformation from sawmiller to watercolor artist in the throes of dementia through person-centered care and the expressive arts. Dr. Potts seeks to make these therapies more widely available through his foundation, Cognitive Dynamics. So with no further ado, we are going to talk with Dr. Potts. So Danny, I'm so excited to have you on the show. You've been on the show, you know, prior and um, you are just so renowned in the industry and so well loved. So I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with you today. But before we get into the line of questions, I always like to just set it up for our audience. If you can tell people um, in your own words, how you've been touched personally in your own family or circle of friends by dementia. Well, absolutely, Lori. And let me just say it's it's uh, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be with you on your on your show. Uh, I mean, I just I think you're doing work that nobody else is doing, and uh, you touch so many people. And you know, I've told you before, it's just essential. And so, I thank you for letting me be on again. It's just it's just a joy. So, um, you know, um, I, as you know, uh, I, I'm a neurologist in in Alabama, and my my father Lester. Um, got Alzheimer's disease when he was about, well, he, he was diagnosed at about the age of 70. And so um, I was touched more deeply uh, through Alzheimer's disease, by Alzheimer's disease, through my father, uh, mm-hmm. I guess, and, and through his journey. He, um, he lived for eight years after that. And of course, as you know, during that journey, he became an artist. And we'll touch, we'll touch more on that uh, in a little while. But, but I guess the summary of all of that care partnership that I had with my mother and with him was that uh, he, they taught me things that I had not been taught in med school and residency about, about this condition and about those living with it. And, and I guess to put it in one sentence, it's don't lose hope. Uh, Don't give up on the person. They are still there. They may be different, but they're still there and we can access them through the various things that we're going to talk about today. So I, it's really changed my practice. That's, that's how I was touched by it most deeply. Well, one of the things, you know, with neurologists, I mean, there's a lot of different specialties. Were you specializing in dementia prior to your, your father? No, I was, I was a general neurologist and still really am a general neurologist. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in private practice, uh, a little bit in academia, and then now at the VA. So I see all comers. But I took a special interest in dementia, of course, after walking the care well, while I was walking through the care care partnership with dad and mother. So I don't have a fellowship in dementia or uh, behavioral neurology, but I've become interested more because of that. Okay, sounds good. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know your dad and his art? Um, because I, I found that fascinating. Um, you know, when I first heard about it and just being able to to see it. I know change my perceptions of what what is possible. Well, thank you. It, it it's a story that doesn't get old for me. It's just changed our lives. Dad, a a rural Alabama sawmiller farmer, grew up in the country at the tail end of the Great Depression, 
was a utilitarian soul. Uh, everything he did was about accomplishing something, about work, saving, and all that stuff. And so he he never would have even explored, you know, much creativity. I mean, he was creative because he built stuff and other things, but he never would have explored art. Um, so we were amazed after Dad got the diagnosis and was struggling through Alzheimer's when he went to an adult daycare center called Caring Days here in Tuscaloosa that had the expressive arts um, programming that we we all love. And, and so he met a retired artist named George Parker there. George, not an art therapist, but just an artist who was giving of his time. And Dad started bringing home watercolor art on little 9 by 14 canvases. Well, Mother asked Dad, Dad, uh, honey, where did you get that? That's a beautiful little hummingbird was the first thing he brought home. Where did you get that hummingbird? It's lovely. Oh, I did it myself. Oh, surely not, honey. You know, so mother couldn't believe he had done this with him almost 50 years. She had never seen anything like it. So he brought home over a hundred after that, over a hundred uh, watercolor paintings, uh, amazing things. And most of them were scenes from his childhood. That we were able to identify uh, persons, images, wood, saws, that sort of thing. So he was telling his life story through it. And uh, we we just were blown away by this. And so I, for one, was struggling through this with dad. You know, I felt like a failure because I, a neurologist, was not able to offer the kind of help to him or mother that I really wanted to. And dad sort of rescued me through the, through the art. I mean, it's the most amazing thing. And so it it really, it, it spoke to me about his person still being there that was being expressed when he couldn't really do it through words anymore. And, and what it drew out of me was, okay, I need to listen. I need to watch. I need to be present with him, you know, while he's showing me this art. And so in that way, we were able to have a relationship that we probably wouldn't have had it not been for the art. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Wow. You know, I, I think of my mom's old journey, you know, she lived with dementia for 30 years and what she taught me, I mean, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it wasn't for her and the beautiful life lessons, you know, if you just kind of slow down, shut up, <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> and, you know, for me, it was really hard. I was in real estate and, you know, I had my pager and my phone and my this and my that probably like you, you know, and you think the world's going to stop if you're, if you're not answering all this stuff. And it really made me slow down and just be present and realize the world's still spinning. And the, for me, the, the level of unconditional love, the faith in the, in the belief and being able to see really somebody's soul, kind of how I totally. say it. And to be able to see that through the artwork, I mean, that had to have just been incredible. Seeing these images, you know, uh, still, when I look at certain of dad's images, it touches me very, very deeply in a spiritual kind of way, uh, because I know that I'm seeing the core of his identity coming mm -hmm. out when many would say he's gone, you know, that's mm -hmm. it, he's, he's brain dead or whatever. Well, he certainly is still in there, and, and that enabled us to connect at a deep level, and others, not just me, others who were in his environment, and, and um, at a time when it would have been almost impossible otherwise, it gave him the, the, the joy of being able to find expression, mm -hmm. of being able to communicate his story when he had lost the verbal ability to do that and connect back with that. So I can look at those images, Lori, and I, I, I still get chills because of what he is expressing. It's, it's a sacred thing for me, you know, really to look at them. That's how I kind of am with my mom's short videos with music. And I can be having the worst day of my life. And, you know, she's been gone since 2014 now. And she just puts me in a good mood. So just seeing the hands go and her trying to, you know, remember the words, but just the, the joy on the face that so many people don't see because they're looking at, well, her hair's not combed or she's got a billy goat hair on her chin or, you know, whatever it might be, her chipped teeth. And it's like, that's not what I see or feel at all. It's so much deeper. And it's triumphant to, to what, you know, in a lot, if I, if I use that word around some people that what are you talking about? This mm -hmm. is tragic. And, and, and in many ways it is tragic. Let's not deny that. But when I see 
And we've seen many since dad, like, like your, your mom, we, we've seen people expressing themselves through mm -hmm. dance, through music, through poetry, through art or whatever. When I see that, I think triumphant, I, I think the triumphant human spirit coming out. I mean, even in late stage people and mm -hmm. you, you, you sort of have to be trained to look for it, you know, and I, and I wasn't to start with. I, I, I sort of, I didn't realize that this level of communication and interaction would be possible but I found out that's not true. And since then, of course, even in late stage with, with some of my patients or some friends that have had dementia or others that I'm working with, I know that there's presence there and it requires that I be present and that I listen. And when I mean listen, of course, I'm talking about all my senses, not just my ears. And so it truly, there's a, there's a depth there that's just amazing. Yeah. Learning that multi-sensory connection, I think is so critically important and and like you said we've kind of been trained of the the doom and gloom and the shell of the body i mean all of those things we've been told over and over and over again and you know i love connecting with you with you and others that see way past that and and bring out this brilliance and bring out hope and purpose and and love at at these deep deep levels that again we've been told aren't going to happen you know, for me, I'll give another example of, of my mom. Um, I was sharing the, the music video with, with a friend of my mom's who could not go visit her. And for 10 years, my mom was in a nursing home and, and uh, she just screamed when she looked at this thing and said, I thought you were taking good care of her because my mom didn't look, she didn't have her makeup on and the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. And here this 76 year old woman is screaming at me in a restaurant. And I kind of got this nervous giggle because I didn't know what to say, because I was so proud of this picture. To me, it was just pure joy. And then I remember looking at her and I said, thank you, Kay. Thank you. What are you thanking me for? And I said, because until this moment, I didn't know that you don't see what I see. She's like, well, what yeah. the heck do you see? Because, you know, my mom's teeth were, I tell people they look like a, um, like a rusted chainsaw with fried rice hanging off them. I mean, they were yeah. chipped, they were broken, they were gross, but you know, toothbrush scared her, all of those things. And so I went through, you know, the glint in her eyes and the dimples. And I said, okay, this is pure joy for my mom now. And, you know, I think she kind of understood a little bit. But I said, it's, it's not about fingernail polish and red lipstick and, you know, the hair being done. I said, this is pure, raw joy. I said, when I look yes. at this picture, I hear my mom giggle. And I'm sure you have those moments too, where you, your heart just melts um, it does. because the connections are so, so deep. So, yes. you know, from this experience with your dad, I want you to tell us about your foundation cognitive dynamics and the expressive art program, you know, that you've brought to life, um, bringing yep. art to life. Uh, I, I just think this is brilliant and more and more people need to understand this, know about this and, and learn what is possible when living with dementia. Well, thank you. I, I, I really, it came out of the heart of dad and, and, and his care, his care partners, and including the folks down at Caring Days who really, really knew how to do it and really mm -hmm. honored him, the person he was. But, you know, we, we had all this art that daddy created after he passed away and we had all the stories and all the relational stuff and the educational piece also, because students had been learning, you know, during this time. And, and so we said, you know, we got to do something with this. So we decided, our family did, to create a foundation, Cognitive Dynamics of 501c3, based here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, with the express purpose of providing opportunities for people living with dementia and care partners to have expressive arts experiences and, and enrich their lives through that. And so we, uh, we started a program called Bringing Art to Life very soon after we created the foundation. And uh, that program, basically what it does is it pairs students, and these can be high school students, um, college students, professional students, with people living with dementia uh, in care settings, various kinds of care settings, in an art therapy experience. And, and so we, we, we usually do it as a class um, at an institution, 
Um, uh, for instance, now we're doing it at the University of Alabama as a psychology class for juniors, but we also do it in Chicago and Birmingham, some other places. But we we teach the students, uh, we give them a little background, of course, on dementia, Alzheimer's and other dementias, the communication piece, how to do that, the research that's going on, um, how to be present, how to center. We do a lot of mindfulness techniques with them. And then we're ready to meet their partners. And so we we either go to an assisted living or an adult daycare or, or whatnot and introduce them to, say, 15 students and about five or six people living with dementia. So each student, uh, each, each person living with dementia has two or three student partners. And we have weekly art therapy experiences. We also have music therapists. We have just musicians that come. We have um, some dramas, that kind of thing, improv. and they they develop a relationship over this time. It's it's not only about the art. There's beautiful art too, but they develop a race, relationship between the students and the people living with dementia and the care partners. We learn the life stories. We produce a life story book that has art in it and that has things that the students have written and letters from loved ones and that sort of thing using the technologies of life bio. Uh, and so we produce this book and then we have a celebration at the end of the semester where we give the books to them. We give them all their art. We have all their families there. We The students get up and tell stories about their experiences and how much they've learned and how valuable it's been to them. And these folks are validated. It's just a lovely time. You know, that that celebration is really the highlight of all of it for us because we get to sit back and watch how this has touched lives. The students are transformed, most of them, almost all of them, and many of the uh, the persons living with dementia are at, at some level too. But I've had I've had many students. We've been doing the program for twelve years now. Many students still write me back, email me, and say, you know what, I, I would not have gone into the medical field, working with the aged or working with dementia or whatever they're going into, had it not been for that experience. And so, and and I get to sit back, Lori, and and you know absorb all of this and grow as a as a, a person, as a neurologist, and I've got all these stories. And so that's where the book came about, by the way, is because I, I I've got to write this down. There's so much richness here, uh, and and so that's the program, and uh, we love it. We've done research on the program um, that that we know, so we know the program does build empathy in students. We know that it. Um, makes kids want to go into fields where they'll work with people with dementia and the aged. We also know it's a stigma reducer. Uh, so, um, and it has other benefits too. So we're, uh, we really love doing the program. It's kind of the highlight of, of, of my career, really. Oh, definitely. Well, and I, I just think, you know, when you had mentioned, you know, how seeing your dad's artwork really transformed you um, as a son, but as a neurologist in terms of seeing things and to be able to get, students um, excited about working in the medical field, you know, working, working with our seniors and, and our elders and people with dementia. That's massive. I mean, especially when you look at today and the shortage we have, to me, these are the types of programs that need to blossom all over the world to help, help get people back to being person-centered or what I like to say is relationship-based. That's typically what, what drew people into to start. And we've kind of imploded on that. And we've, we've gotten forced to be so task oriented and, and regulations I know are needed to a point, but when we lose the humanity and when we lose the purpose, when we lose the dignity within that, and we're not giving people the tools to just be able to breathe and go, I'm glad I'm here. You know, I think we've lost that. I'm glad I'm here. Um, I'm making a difference. We're making a difference together. And, you know, like you said, changing the stigma on all different levels. And my guess is when you're, when you gather in a room, just like with Alive Inside, you know, when the music hit, it changed everybody in the room. It wasn't yeah. just that person listening to the music, but everybody was like, I didn't know that was possible. And it's That's like, right. you're, you're, you're um, just birthing miracle after miracle in terms of, of hope. And that's, that's pretty cool. It's incredible. And, and to see the students change by that and to see the, you know, their partners with dementia liven up and sort of become themselves in, in there. And, and, and everybody, it, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, of course you can tell age differences, 
but it's hard to tell who's who in there. You know, it, mm-hmm. it, it's sort of the, the small groups meld together and, and within the larger groups and everybody is just, it's just a relational milieu. You know, everybody validates everybody. It's a safe place. First of all, you know, it's a safe place. We are compassionate listeners. So we are, we are absorbing the things that are coming out without judgment. You know, and that's part where the mindfulness piece comes in. You know, we really do practice mindfulness and and we go in there without prejudging anything. You know, we're going to have this present moment experience and it's it's it is going to be what it is. And so that opens them up and it's free. And the 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 partners learn that over the semester. I mean, they they may forget they've seen that student before, but they somehow sense that it's a comfortable and safe place. And so they express themselves more. You know, we do have music sessions as well. And some people that, you know, I think uh, Linda Everman and Don Windorf come in and, and do music for us, live music. And it's interesting to see the sessions change after that. After we have one music session, mm-hmm. then the art for the, the art therapy from then on is more expressive, interestingly. So the sessions are different after the music. So the music is doing incredible things. But but it's you're you're exactly mm-hmm. right. This is needed. Um for many reasons. And one of, one of those is to build empathy in our students and our young people. You know, we have an empathy drain, you know, the, the, te- the technological age in many ways, I think in the disconnection has, has produced a lack of empathy in young people. And this, this is helping to restore that in a small way. Oh, I agree. And I think, I think it's so missed and, and kids don't even know they're missing it. They know something's missing, but they're not quite sure because everyone's, you know, thumbing it up, you know, texting and, and doing yes. different things, even if they're in the same room. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to see. And I, like I said, I would love to see this expanded. In fact, I'm going to throw something out to you and I don't know if sure. it would be um, appropriate or not, but I have a program called Dementia in the Arts. And with that, what I've been doing is interviewing people around the world and with dementia and they talk about their artwork. And it's been pretty profound, um, just the, the level and, you know, what they do and what they get out of it. And I don't know if any of your people would be able to speak to that, but we could, we could change it up and have it be a group in terms of what are they getting out of this whole experience? Because I think more people need to know about what you're doing, what's available and the impact that it's having. Um, I, I just really believe in what you're doing well i thank you and i think it's a lovely idea i mean you could you could even have a you know person living with dementia a couple of students with Mm -hmm. that person to express what it's meant for them i mean i think that's a great idea you know i think um also going back to the technology issue you know at an at a time when when technology I, i think has has had something to do with the the lost empathy Mm-hmm. Um, we also utilize technology in, in sort of fresh ways in the class. And one of the things we do is we work with embodied labs uh, uh, to expose the kids to a virtual reality, first person dementia experience so that they can go through some of the modules and be a person mm-hmm. living with Alzheimer's or living with Lewy body dementia. And that's been helpful too. Uh, to get to because they're they're so into tech stuff anyway, and that's one of the ways to 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 work on the empathy as well. But no, I think being on your uh, on your uh, you know on your program would be wonderful, and I th- I'm sure we could find one of our partners that would like to you know to do that. Yeah, and then on the side, I always have um, you know resources, and I would love to list cognitive dynamics on there for people as well, you know, to be able to reach out to you because it, yes. they're just so profound. Um, it, it's just, for me, it's been life-changing to see. And I mean, some of them I look at and go, these people should be commissioned artists, you know, yeah. and, th- and this should be a traveling show. And I know that you've done some of that with your, with your dad's artwork, but I, you know, I would love to see more and more of this artwork being displayed in communities, in hospitals, I just think it's a wonderful way to connect, give hope, be creative and just catch people off guard where it's a more comfortable conversation for them to be able to sneak into. I agree. And, and I think to get the art out there, uh, I think, you know, programs like yours are essential. I know um, you're seeing more, you know, art from people who are living with illness. You know, I I think that for instance, practical neurology, which is a, a journal that, uh, that uh, that we're familiar with, it goes to, to every neurologist in the country. They've started using 
artwork on their cover and then they profile the artist uh, in the magazine they use dad's art for one edition but i think it's so important to get that out there this gives hope to so many people mm -hmm. um and and i would love to see this has always been a dream too is is to sort of have a national repository of dementia art you know that may be an online you know a library that that you know could be accessed through an app or something like that that people could thumb through maybe the story about the artist or something like that i think there's enough of it out there now you know where that could be done yeah well with our group we we've, we've had woodworkers we've had clay watercolors um oil as oils photography um, poetry. I mean, just, and I'd love to get more dance and music and things in there as well, but wow. everything is welcomed at every level. And some of the stories behind the artwork are just fabulous. Like one guy, yes. he, he had a clay piece and it was, you know, just kind of a gray square and he, sh he showed it to us and it had two slits for eyes and a slit for the mouth. Right. And I know better, but in my mind, I was thinking that's basic. And I, and I've yeah. told them this, but I mean, and that just came out. I mean, it didn't come out of my mouth, but it, it popped into my mind Yeah. and I, and I kind of slapped myself, you know, going, Lori, you know, better. Yeah. And then he went on to explain it. And he said, this is how people see me. I have lost my affect. I don't, oh, wow. I don't have emotions anymore. Yeah. So this is who I've become. And then he turns this square clay piece and you see yellow and blue and green flowing out the back of the head. And he goes, and those are my memories. And I have no oh. idea when they're going to, and it was just the most powerful, powerful how description. Creative is that? Wow. I know. So, I mean, there's so Amazing. much behind all of this stuff. It's, it's just incredible. Well, let's yeah. talk about your book. Um, sure. You know, you said you had all these stories that you wanted to get out. What, what's your goal with um, bringing art to life? Well, you know, after a few years of doing this, mm -hmm. um, students come and go, participants with dementia come and go, faculty, other faculty come and go. But I, I was sort of the one constant because I'm the course director for it and we started the program. So I realized I had this treasure trove of, of experiential information, you know, uh, from, from people living with dementia, their care partners and the students. And, mm -hmm. and really from me, that that I needed to sort of collate and get together. And of course we, you know, we do releases and all that sort of thing and we change names and all that. But 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 there was too much richness here for me to not, you know, you know, share that. So oh, about four or five years ago, I began to say, well, I got to do a book. And so I began to collect stories, kind of write essays and do some poems, because you know, I started writing poetry after dad started painting. That my mother said, Well, that's almost as amazing as Lester painting, you writing poetry. <laughs> but she you know, but anyways, that was a poetry's been powerful for me and has helped me get through all this. But but I I began to write poetry about certain experiences that we'd had and sort of collect all this. And my dear, dear friend, Dr. Richard Morgan, who uh, has passed away uh, recently, I'm, I'm sure you probably know as well, just a, a wonderful man who was an advocate in this space, a Presbyterian uh, pastor. Um, he uh, has written many books, and um, he said, listen, because I, I, I sent him a sample. He said, "You got this has to be published, and I'm going to put you in contact with my editor friend at Whipfenstock Publishing. And uh, so Whiffenstock took it through their resource division. And uh, so we tweaked it and, and, and got something out and it was published last year. But, but the goal of the book really uh, is to tell dad's story, show how that inspired a program th through which many other people have been transformed, through which beautiful art has been presented and through which people with dementia have been honored. And to then tell the transformational part uh, in all of the, in all of the people's lives, but also in my life. And actually to kind of some, because in, in a way the, the book is about me too, is about how I've been transformed through working with people living with dementia and through their student partners. And so it really is, it's very personal for me also. It's not just stories about them. And so at the end of the book, one is hopefully left with a rich, rich experience um, uh, about, about transformation through the arts and through seeing the human being inside the, the dementia shell. 
and honoring that human being. So that's really what it's kind of what it's about. Well, it's an easy read, but you've, you've broken it down really nice into, into different sections um, from the stories to the poetry to, you know, just setting things up in the book. Was there one part that was tougher than another to pull together in the book? Well, yes, there, there were two or three. Uh, one, one of those was um, about an individual that we had in the program who was living with Alzheimer's disease, who actually passed away during the program. And I actually, he wandered off and was found six weeks later uh, in, a, in a ditch. And, and so the story about him uh, was, was difficult to write, uh, but it was, it was, it was also in, in, in another way, easy to write because it was very emotional. And so I didn't really have to think about it. I mean, I just, I poured it out and I had the students experience to help me do that. It, it was, it was so amazing because we didn't know what had happened to him. We just knew he was gone and it had wandered away. We didn't know that. But when I asked the students, I said, do you all want to, because this was about halfway through the semester. I said, do you all want to stay with him? In other words, continue to write about him, create art for him, use his personhood as the theme for you and write your book about him. Or do you want us to find you another partner? And without hesitation, both of them, and I may get, I may get emotional telling you this, mm -hmm. without hesitation, and both of, them, both of them said, no, we want to stay with him because he's, he's our friend. He's the one who's become our friend through this process. And we're going to honor him and stay in that space of him for this. And so they did, they did it beautifully. They did it courageously. And what we had left was at the final celebration, we set a chair for him and they got up and they showed his art and they, they showed his book that they created and they told everybody else about him. It was as if he were there. And I told him later, I said, you know, who else was there? I said, my dad was there too, because my dad was very much like this gentleman. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know they would have been friends. And I said, and, and see, by that time, we'd found out what had happened to him. So we found out at the end of the semester, what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And so they knew that by the time of the experience, but, but it wound up being a very, very healing experience for all of us. And, and God bless the family and everything. But, but anyway, that was, that was hard. Telling about my, my dad's death experience was somewhat hard. And then the last thing, telling about my own darkness, you know, that, that was exposed during this process and how that was healed to a certain extent through, through the program. That was hard too. But at the end of it, you know, I look back on it and say, no, it had to be done. And I'm so glad that, 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 that I was able to do it. Well, in each one of those, like you said, is a healing process. You know, and you got to kind of go through that darkness to get to the light. But, um, you know, when you were saying, you know, nope, they wanted to stay with him. They wanted to honor. I was getting teary going. Yeah. And, I, and I can see that. I mean, these relationships are powerful um, yeah. and, and they need to be honored. And yeah. what, a beautiful, what a beautiful way to do that. And then to be able to give that book to the family. I just think, yeah. wow, what a legacy. Lori, it redefined for me what, what personhood means. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 for me now, personhood is much larger to, to me than an individual. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's about, it's about the impact that individual has had on others that are in relationships with that individual and, and, and the change that it brings in those folks. And it really goes on. And I, I've, I've talked to Ian Kramer and others about this uh, it, it, with Lead Coalition. It, it goes on somehow. And God, of course, we can have our spiritual beliefs, too. We believe that, that someone does live on. I do, you know, in faith, but by faith, believe there's a life after death. But even among those who are still living, the person still there through the love that we have for them and the way that we honor their memory. And so it was a beautiful example of that. I'll, I'll never hopefully forget that. Well, and again, it's those, it's those lessons we learn on this journey that stay with us. You know, yes. the lessons your dad taught you uh, of what you're doing, the lessons my mom taught me of what I'm doing now. And those, it, it is, it truly is just a, an ocean of ripples. And, mm -hmm. and I think, again, I think that's one of the things we're missing in today's world is people not understanding the impact each and every one of us has 
on so many people that we might not even know. We may have never talked to them. You know, it might have been a glance walking by them and just a smile. But, it, yeah. you know, we're making we're making choices every single day. And and we are much bigger than ourselves. Yes. And 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 I think that there's once you accept that you see yourself differently and you see others differently as well. You know, yeah. the story piece, it's you're, mm -hmm. you're exactly right. The story piece, uh, we, we learn through stories, you know, we remember through stories, we become a part of each other's stories. And I think the story part is so incredible. I mean, all the students have stories about this. They can tell, I told some in the book, but there are many more, but we sort of are a part of each other's stories and, and, and we, we accompany each other through those things. And I think that's just like a quilt, you know, it's like my friend Linda who, who, who quilts uh, in the Alzheimer's quilt initiative and all that. It's, it's like a big quilt of these, of these elements of our personhood that, that we, you know, we live through. Yeah. It really is um, building unity through that sense of community, um, which is so, so beautiful. And, you know, it's something I don't think we talk about enough when those, when those good things happen, or even when things bad or sad happen, you know, we can get really down. And I know for myself, I've learned to, even if I'm yelling at God, you know, I'm <laughs> sometimes I get a little yeah. mad with him because I'm not understanding what's going on down here. Um, yeah. But I have learned to ask the question, what's the lesson? I know there's a lesson in this and yeah. as frustrated as I might get, I realize that I'm not really focusing on finding the answer. I think I am, but it's almost kind of like that being too task oriented, you know, in, in the care industry, you mm -hmm. lose that relationship and it's getting back to the basics of what is really important. And it's not checking stuff off. It's really yes. about how we make one another feel. And there are such gorgeous lessons, you know, wrapped in all of that. Um, yes, I, yes. I just think even with your program, you know, if, if um, more doctors, you know, participated in even a portion of this, even if it was at a, at a conference setting in a breakout room, you know, type deal, how that would change the delivery of a diagnosis. Oh, Oh, clearly. That's one of the that's one of the biggest things that we've talked about. You know, I um, I'm fortunate to get to work with a lot of a lot of good folks in the program. And one of those is Angel Duncan, who is an art therapist who helped us start the program and is a is a member of the board of directors of our foundation and our executive arts director. I've learned so much from Angel about the expressive arts and about what they do. But one of the things that we tried to do is connect up you know, uh, the medical field and the expressive artists, you know, expressive art therapists. And of course, Angel is Angel wears a lot of hats. One of those is in is in Alzheimer's and dementia research and imaging research and all of that. So she's she lives in both worlds. And so she easily connects them. But but in 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 my world as a neurologist, I know that there are not enough connections between the various disciplines. Mm -hmm. And we tend to be insular, you know, and 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 so there's a lot of uh, collaborative possibility there. One of the things that that is you just touched on, and I think it's so important, is the way the community of folks living with dementia interacts with intersects with the medical community, mm -hmm. and 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 about the, the sort of the treacherous road there. You know, it's hard. It's hard being a neurologist. I'll tell you, it's it's, it's hard to deliver a dementia diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's hard for physici physicians to to deliver a diagnosis about which they don't for which they don't have a cure, and and that taps into a lot of stuff. You know, our own mortality. You know, uh, you know our our perfectionism and, and all those traits. You know that we have lack of control, et cetera. Um, but but working with people living with dementia helps if we let it. If we let it teach us, it helps us be able to do that. You know, one of the things that happens in these art therapy sessions, and Angel could talk about this well in other art therapists, is that we all have traumas, we all have wounds that, that may be very deep, that may have happened a long time ago, and that we're going to have to deal with in our lives. And at some point, we got to make meaning of that, or we're going to die a bitter person, you know. And so if you're living with dementia, it becomes tough to, I'm sure, to be able to do that, to tie those knots up and, and to deal with it. Well, the expressive arts help us do that. And one of the things that art therapy does is it helps people to express with and deal with those, 
those previous woundings, attachment wounds and traumas and stuff through the process of creativity and bring some healing to that so that we were able to incorporate some of these wounds in, in, in the tapestry of our lives. I don't think many physicians have been able to do that very well. And, and so we, we, I mean, we're human beings. We bring this humanity, this broken humanity into a patient doctor interaction, provider interaction. And, and, and sometimes we come as, as a false self in there, you know, mm-hmm. we, we come as somebody who's the perfect, the clinician on a pedestal, et cetera. But we, we all have, you know, we all have uh, human uh, issues that we're dealing with and so to watch this process happening, you know, where, whereby someone is making meaning of those things has been very therapeutic for me. And mm-hmm. I think there's a lot we physicians and really anybody can learn about the importance of, you know, dealing with, you know, with our own humanity in the relationship with others. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, it makes, it makes a ton of sense. And I just think, you know, again, over and over with the doctors, if they felt like there was hope, even if it wasn't a cure, Mm -hmm. it would change. It would change the delivery. And and I've heard that from family after family on how uncomfortable it was to get that diagnosis because the physician was uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. you know, giving that diagnosis. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons we created Dementia Map was to try to get resources out in, and we know that, that physicians and, and so forth don't have the time to dig up all these specifics, but we also know people who attend support groups like memory cafes and stuff say one of the, the best and most healing things for them is to feel not alone, you know, to be in community. And if we can just help people connect to those types of things and they automatically share different resources. And, you know, it's, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And I, I would like to think that it might take some of the heaviness off of giving that diagnosis instead of saying, here's a prescription, it might work. Yes, I, I agree so much. And, and, you know, living well is, mm-hmm. is, is, a, is a term that Really, I believe now in many ways, that's really what life is about is learning to, to to me in one way is learning to live well ourselves and help others live well too. And helping persons living with chronic illness to live well, even though we don't have a cure, that's what we ought to be about in the medical community. And a lot of us are, a lot of us are not, you know, we don't mm-hmm. see that as a goal mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and really helping ourselves live well too you know if we learn to see it that way then we're going to be able to to better live live well ourselves which is important one of the things that that i think this program and others like it can do is to help all of the elements that are participating in it to live better providers care partners students people living with dementia etc and so living well is an important part of all of this and i think it's an important part of dementia care yeah well in in that sharing of stories is so powerful. It's just, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's life changing and it makes us not so judgmental. You know, everything's not, I mean, there's a saying in dementia, we know when you've met one person, you've met one. Well, when you've met one care partner, you've met one when you're in one environment. I mean, everything is changes and is fluid. And that didn't just start when dementia hit that has been all of our lives, but we, Mm -hmm. we like freeze up and go, no, we don't want any change at all. We want our life the way it used to be. Well, it was fluid before and it's going to be even more fluid now. And the more spontaneous and um, fluid we get, the easier it is on everyone where we're not fighting those, those battles, those stigmas, but we're just supporting one another and having belief that the, the soul is so strong and our connections will never be lost. They might, we might connect differently, but for me on, on my journey and I, you know, I'm just one person, those connections got s- way stronger than I ever imagined yeah. and words yeah. really weren't needed. And even after my mom passed, we were still connected and still communicating. And, yeah. and so it just really opened up a whole, a whole different world in terms of, again, tapping into those multi-sensory connections that we have 
that we seem to focus on just words when we right. all know three quarters of our communication <laughs> is the multi-sensory, but we, re- yes. we revert back. Um, and, and I think we revert back out of fear. And when you can, when you can approach this disease through art, um, you know, through film, through music, people aren't expecting to learn. They aren't, ex- they, you know, it, it's just a really subtle way to kind of open up the door without using any words, you know, without, uh, without lecturing. I mean, it's just, it's raw and it's real and you can't deny seeing it and feeling it. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you're in it, the reality of it is amazing. You know, it's, you know, one of the things that we do is, I mean, I did this too. This is just natural is we try to hang on to the way things were because, you know, that's how dad was 10 years ago with me. You know, Mm -hmm. the part of dad that was like that 10 years ago is the dad I want now. But unfortunately, dad's different now. You know, I love Madeline Langle, I believe it was, uh, who said something like, because you are not how I would have you be, I blind myself to who you are. So, So you're not like I'm expecting you to be. So therefore, I'm missing the person that's there now. Yep. And so one of the things that interacting with somebody through the expressive arts does is it helps you meet them where they are now, learn how they're expressing themselves now, and thereby, you know, have a relationship with them. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and by the way, as you know, people living with dementia, they are using all of their modalities to communicate. I mean, body language means a lot to them. I actually think they're probably better at picking up our body language oh, you know, yeah. than most people are because they've, they've had to be that way, you know, to survive. And so it really brings, so uh, Dr. Jim Houston, who is another person that I've that's been a mentor of mine said, talking about his wife, Rita, who had Alzheimer's, he said, she's bringing things out of me that are potentials for my own growth. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the way he saw it. it. It really is pulling out that love, that um, listening ability, that present centeredness, you know, this growth experience as a care partner uh, uh, it, it is pretty incredible. But you, you got to see it that way. And there's some days I know you can't see it that way. I mean, okay, okay. I, I mean, let's get, we'll cut each other some slack, you know, as care partners. Cause I mean, I've been there too, uh, in a way, but, 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 you know, so we can't always be that way, but, but if we can have the goal of, okay, can I see some growth here? Is there the potential for me to love more here? Can I, you know, there's always that, you know, like you said, it can be a lesson. There can be a lesson there. Yeah. When you were talking about, you know, wanting your dad 10 years ago, I, that kind of hit me like a, like a lead balloon when I was going through family photos one day. And I, you know, I have this big, huge plastic container full of pictures that never got put in in albums, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was, and I pulled out one of my wedding day and it was my mom, my dad and I on my wedding day. And I realized by looking at that, how much I admired my mom and, and how she was, you know, she loved to celebrate life and she was really organized and involved. And, and uh, it got me reminiscing about when Tom and I got engaged and we called my folks and my mom, they were all excited. My mom and dad were all excited. Then they hung up the phone and my mom called back 20 minutes later with the church, the menu and the hall. I mean, she had it all lined up in 20 minutes and, and I, I absolutely loved that about her. And as I'm looking at this picture, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's so unfair that I am putting her on this pedestal and I'm trying to make her be this person. And I look at the picture again and I go, everything's changed. My yeah. dad's dead. My mom's got dementia. I'm divorced. I have no right to freeze frame somebody in time, but we do yeah, that we do. so much in our life, not just with dementia, but with a lot of different things. With and everything. when you, and when you realize that, and when you realize how silly that is, you know, and how unrealistic and how offended you would be if someone was trying to put you in a box and how upset you would be. It just puts it in a whole different, different frame. You know, dementia is a training ground for life. You know, it really is, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of other challenging things are training grounds for life. But I mean, if we looked at, at the microcosm of dementia, there's so many lessons right there that can make you become a better person, you know, a richer person, if you let it. Oh, I agree. I always say that my mom's 30 year, you know, journey, which I wouldn't wish on anybody 
was the greatest gift I'll ever receive in my life. And people look yeah. at me like cockeyed, like what? And then I yeah. go on to explain all the things that I learned. And, you know, I thought I was a good person before, but I think I'm a lot better person now. I still have to grow yeah. and, and stuff, but yeah, what's good for dementia is really good for everything in life. I, mm -hmm. I've not found anything that it would harm in another setting, you know, yeah. if I, yeah. if I applied that, yeah. um, now you started writing poetry, you said, can yeah. you share maybe, uh, you know, a poem or two from the book with our, with our, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, I, so when dad was, was coming through his illness, um, mm -hmm. I reached out at, really within myself, I guess, reached in is the, is the right word to, and started writing and had never written poetry before. And some of the poems I wrote, I was like, who wrote that? You know, I can't mm -hmm. believe I wrote that, but it was expressing something very deep gratitude, pain, you know, resentment, all that stuff came out, but, but I've continued to write. And I mean, I tell you, I write two or three a week, three or four a week. I mean, I've written over 1600 poems now. I, 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 and now I'm partnering, I'm pairing them with photographs that I take. Also, I do a lot of uh, nature photography. And so I'll write about that. And I've paired them with some of dad's images as well, but I've, I've, I've got one here that, that basically talks about visiting someone with dementia Mm -hmm. and listening to that person um even though they may not be saying something with words and i'd like to share that one if i could so sure. picture you know picture picture th this is this is a person living with dementia who is thanking a person who came and listened when okay. most everybody else was it's called you chose to listen i know you must have been busy i'm sure you stay that way i suspect there may have been others who needed you today but for me, you made one decision, a solitary choice that changed the color of the world and gave me back my voice. My mind's been gripped by confusion and my memory forgets. I likely won't recall the names of faceless silhouettes, but there's nothing wrong with my feelings like sadness and pain and joy. There are sheltered spaces in us all that dementia can't destroy. So my memory has just recorded with the contours of your face a true sense of validation, familiarity, and place, a profound yet nameless knowing, relational and real, simply because you cared about how your actions made me feel. There among the busy bodies brushing by my chair, you sto chose to stop and listen to the soul behind the stare. When I saw your kind intentions to truly understand, it was as if some hidden part of me went reaching for a hand that love seemed to be extending through your presence and your paws, and I feel the gifts that love extends, it never yet withdraws. In choosing to listen to me, you did something else quite rare. You decided to see what still remains of the person sitting there, to regard with respect and compassion and perhaps a sense of awe the sacred eternal sanctum of the suffering self you saw. In this no one's land of confusion, you brought a sense of peace, of trust and vulnerability, of expression and release. So my spirit came out of hiding in the space between us two, and the air between your eyes and mine turned the warmest shade of blue like an iridescent ocean in backwaters of the mind a place I long to sit beside but rarely now can find. Please know how deeply I thank you that you, you stopped by. If I thought about it long enough, I, su I suspect that I might cry. But the tears would not be tears of grief, but of gratitude you came. For your listening has reminded me, love will not forget my name. And so that's something that came out of this experience, Lori, with bringing art to life with my father, with the other care partners that I know, and with the students. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Look, I, the only credit for that I take is I'm sort of a radio receiver that, that kind of got that and put it down on mm -hmm. paper. But the fact that, that, that I, I can share that and look, I'm very careful about, I don't want to assume anything about what it's like mm -hmm. to live with dementia. You know, I, I try to be very respectful of people, but I do try to put myself in their shoes at times and write from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And and I hope I hope I've done honor to to that with these poems. Uh, it certainly has been therapeutic to me. So. Oh, beautiful! You got me all teary eyed. It was just like, a, okay, hold it together, Lori. Hold it together. <laughs> it, well, it is you. beautiful. Just thank you. 
Thank you. Beautiful. And I mean, every single line, it was just, it, it was so poignant. And so mm. I, I think anybody on this journey can, uh, can relate to that or any type of chronic illness or um, just anybody who, who doesn't feel valued, you know, or validated or seen in the world, you know, has had those moments where someone just took the time. We just took the time. And I, and I thought it was so important when you said, you know, you cared about, um, I don't think I have the words quite right, but you cared about how you made me feel. Yeah. 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 You You know, know, Maya Angelou talked about that. Others have talked about it. That's, that's important. We have to put ourselves in their shoes. How would we feel if we didn't recognize anything around us? If all these people were strangers, if I'm hungry and don't know how to tell people, uh, the people are walking by. I don't, I'm not home. Where is home? What is home? You know, how, how would we feel? And, and, and that, that, that to me is enough motivation to get out there and try to advocate like you do. And like I do, and like many others do, Hey, we got to do something about this. We can do better as a society, Mm -hmm. you know, in dealing with folks and helping people and finding a cure and finding treatments and supporting care partners. We can do better. We got to put ourselves in their, in their shoes. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think those words are, are much bigger than just dementia. You know, I think that's part of the separation is, is everyone is thinking no one understands me and people are picking sides instead of really having some empathy and wanting to learn what, what, what is it like, you know, Mm -hmm. and just being kind or, or even how we phrase things, the tone of voice, you know, the, you know, the, the eye contact that we give, all of those things are giving off messages. And I think we are so unconscious of what we are, are saying on that multi-sensory level. We don't even know. All I said was this, and it's like, but it was the eye roll. It was the, yeah. this, it was the tone of voice and people aren't, they're not packaging those things mm-hmm. as being mm-hmm. relevant. And right. it's huge. It's, it's a different way of seeing. And, and, you know, sometimes we have to be taught those things. We all, we all have that capacity inside us, mm-hmm. but from our life experiences, we may not have been able to bring that out. But one of the mm-hmm. things that I want to do with this program and others, you know, and support others is the things that bring out the empathy, the things mm-hmm. that, that increase, increase empathy and lessen stigma. And that's, that's the space I want to be in. You know, I, I really do. That's what life's about. If we all had more empathy, things would be much different. I agree. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I could talk with you, you know, for a week and, and still Same not here. run out of questions. And Same stuff. here. Um, this yeah. has just been such a joy. So I want to give people contact information uh, to, to reach out to Dr. Daniel C. Potts known as Danny to all of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, he can be found on LinkedIn as Daniel C. Potts. He has a blog, which is danielcpotts.wordpress.com. Uh, you can find him on Twitter as Daniel C. Potts um, and also Instagram and Facebook is Daniel um, dot Potts. So you're, you're pretty consistent there. So many people have so many different names on different social medias. You grabbed them up yeah. early, it sounds like. So, <laughs> that's that, right. so that was good. And then if people want to get a hold of your foundation, Cognitive Dynamics, you can just go to cognitivedynamics.org. They are also on Facebook as Cognitive Dynamics Foundation and on Twitter as Cog Dynamics. So please reach out, spread the word, and don't forget to go out and buy the book, Bringing Art to Life. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful um, job you are doing in this life of bringing people together and helping them find hope and peace and purpose and, um, and empathy and compassion. It's, it's quite, uh, quite amazing what you've accomplished. So thank you. Well, Lori, I'm very grateful and I'm thankful for old Lester, who I feel is still up there guiding the way for me. Yep. So, uh, yep. Thank you so much for having me on. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. And to our listeners, I hope you like, click and share this episode. I think this is just really powerful. And again, you know, check them out, you know, see how you can pull cognitive uh, dynamics into your area. 
and uh, some of their programs. And the book, Bringing Art to Life, would make a great gift for so many people. Uh, so don't don't forget that too. And just because the holidays are almost over, I mean that's not the only time you give a gift, you know. <laughs> so right. this is a this is a great this would be a great book to you know give even to your physician. There's not a place that this wouldn't fit. You know, tell your libraries about it. There's a lot of dementia friendly areas um, within our library systems, our schools at all different levels. It's endless. So. Again, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to having you back with an update later on because you're always moving and shaking and making, making life a better world for all of us. So thanks, Danny. Look forward to being back with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.